SpaceX launched a Crew Dragon spacecraft on April 23, carrying four astronauts from three nations to the International Space Station. A Falcon 9 rocket lifted off from Launch Complex 39A at Kennedy Space Center in Florida on Friday, marking NASA's first-ever crew mission launch with a reused SpaceX rocket and capsule. On board the Crew Dragon Endeavour are NASA astronauts Shane Kimbrough and Megan MacArthur, ESA astronaut Thomas Peskett, and JAXA astronaut Akihiko Hashide. After a 2-minute 40-second burn, the first stage rocket detached from the second stage, ignited its engines, and slowly returned to Earth to land on a floating platform off the coast of Florida. Meanwhile, the Crew 2 astronauts continued for another 6 minutes powered by the second stage booster, which put the Dragon crew capsule into a low Earth orbit. The flight to the International Space Station wasn't entirely smooth. As the astronauts were preparing for sleep on Friday, SpaceX flight controllers called up to warn them of a possible space junk collision hazard. The Crew-2 astronauts put their SpaceX pressure suits and helmets on and returned to their seats as directed, but the debris ultimately passed by the spacecraft without incident. Less than 24 hours after its launch from Florida, on Sunday morning, the Crew Dragon spacecraft arrived at the International Space Station and docked with the forward port of the Harmony module. A couple of hours later, the hatches between the two vehicles were opened, and after about 35 minutes, the astronauts joined the seven others already aboard the ISS. With the arrival of Crew-2, the station has 11 people on board for the first time since the STS-134 shuttle mission in May 2011. The mission is the third crewed flight of the Crew Dragon in less than a year, after the Demo-2 mission in May 2020 and the Crew-1 mission in November. The Crew-1 spacecraft is still at the space station, and it will return with NASA astronauts Michael Hopkins, Victor Glover, and Shannon Walker, and JAXA astronaut Soichi Noguchi on April 28. After the welcome ceremony, the Crew-2 astronauts were given a safety briefing before beginning the process of making the space station their home for the next six months, as the crew performs hundreds of science experiments in a multitude of areas of study. On April 19, NASA's Ingenuity Mars helicopter became the first aircraft in history to make a powered, controlled flight on another planet. The 1.8-kilogram helicopter performed the flight at 7.34 a.m. Universal Time, a time the Ingenuity team determined would have optimal energy and flight conditions. But data from the flight, relayed through the Perseverance rover and Mars Relay Network, arrived at Earth a little more than three hours later. An initial analysis of the data by the project team at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory indicates the flight went as expected, with Ingenuity taking off, flying to an altitude of about 3 meters, and hovering before landing 39.1 seconds later. Ingenuity's initial flight demonstration was autonomous, piloted by onboard guidance navigation and control systems. Three days later, on April 22, Ingenuity successfully completed its second Mars flight. Lasting 51.9 seconds, the flight added several new challenges to the first, including a higher maximum altitude, longer duration, and sideways movement. Ingenuity climbed to 5 meters this time, and its flight control system performed a slight 5-degree tilt, allowing some of the thrust from the counter-rotating rotors to accelerate the craft sideways for 2 meters before heading back to the center of the airfield to land. As with the first test, the Perseverance rover obtained imagery of the flight attempt 64.3 meters away at Van Zyl Overlook, using its nav cam and mast cam Z imagers. Each second of each flight provides an abundance of Mars in-flight data for comparison to the modeling, simulations, and tests performed back here on Earth. According to NASA, operating an aircraft in a controlled manner at Mars, which is an atmosphere with only about 1% of the density at Earth's surface was a challenge. NASA is planning to conduct three more flight attempts, and during the next flight, the helicopter will move 50 meters sideways and back before landing. According to the project officials, the plans for the fourth and fifth flights were still to be determined. Meanwhile, on April 20, NASA's Perseverance rover extracted oxygen from the Martian atmosphere for the first time. A toaster size experimental instrument aboard Perseverance, called the Mars Oxygen In Situ Resource Utilization Experiment, or MOXIE, converted some of the red planet's thin carbon dioxide rich atmosphere into oxygen on Tuesday. Mars' atmosphere is 96% carbon dioxide, and MOXIE works by separating oxygen atoms from these carbon dioxide molecules. After a two hour warm up period, MOXIE began producing oxygen at a rate of 6 grams per hour.
The conversion process requires high levels of heat to reach a temperature of approximately 800 degrees Celsius. After an hour of operation, the total oxygen produced was about 5.4 grams, enough to keep an astronaut healthy for about 10 minutes of normal activity. MOXIE is designed to generate up to 10 grams of oxygen per hour. This technology demonstration was designed to ensure the instrument survived the launch from Earth, a nearly seven-month journey through deep space, and touchdown with Perseverance on February 18. MOXIE is expected to extract oxygen at least nine more times over the course of a Martian year. For over two decades, the International Space Station has operated as a research spacecraft for astronauts from around the world. Science experiments conducted on the ISS are viewed as integral to future exploration and have even provided the foundation for breakthroughs here on Earth. But now, geopolitics are threatening to put that work at risk. Russia is mulling the launch of its orbital space station in 2025 as it debates withdrawing from the ISS program to go it alone. On April 18, Deputy Prime Minister Yuri Borisov noted that Russia's existing commitment only extends to the end of 2024 and that Russia was not happy with the current condition of the space station. A few days after, on Wednesday, the head of Russia's Roscosmos Space Agency, Dmitry Rogozin, spoke of an independent Russian space station being in operation by 2030. The country's space agency has reportedly started work on the station's first core module. According to Roscosmos, Russia's Energia Space Corporation was aiming to have the module ready for launch in 2025. The Russian station, unlike the ISS, would most likely not be permanently crewed because its orbit path would expose it to higher radiation. But cosmonauts would visit and it would also use artificial intelligence and robots. According to various sources, Russia plans to spend up to $6 billion to launch its space station project. Russian cosmonauts have worked with counterparts from the United States and 16 other countries on the ISS since 1998. Russia has been sending astronauts to the ISS for the past nine years, and it lost its monopoly for manned flights last year after SpaceX performed its first operational mission to the orbiting lab for NASA. Vladimir Putin has also warned that the U.S. decision to launch a space force suggests the White House views space as a military theater and plans to conduct operations there. According to Roscosmos, a final decision will be made depending on the technical condition of the station's modules, as well as their plans to deploy a national space station. Roscosmos stressed that as soon as a decision on these issues is made, talks with partners will begin on the terms and forms of cooperation after 2024. Now, let's discuss some of the major Starship updates from the past week. After completing the cryogenic proof test on April 12, SpaceX was initially expected to conduct the static fire and suborbital test flight of Starship serial number 15 last week. But SN15 encountered several unknown delays, resulting in the cancellation of road closures and temporary flight restrictions. On April 15, Raptor engines serial numbers 54, 61, and 66 were simultaneously transported to the launch site for installation. SN61 and 66 were quickly installed in a few days, but SN54 was ultimately returned to the build site for additional work. After a series of inspections at the build site, on April 19, Raptor serial number 54 got transported back to the pad for a successful installation. Elon Musk had previously said that SN15 will be the first Starship prototype to fly with upgraded Raptor engines. The differences between these new Raptors and older engines are not entirely clear, but subtle differences in plumbing layout and installed components suggest a general change throughout the entire engine design. Recently, more thermal protection tiles were installed on the tank section of SN15. According to Elon Musk, SN15 has hundreds of design improvements and upgrades to cover some of the problems that have prevented SpaceX from sticking the landing so far without a rapid unscheduled disassembly. So, let's wait to see if the upgrades on Starship SN15 and its Raptor engines will combine to produce a more reliable and more successful vehicle. Pending a successful static fire, SN15 will be the fifth Starship to attempt a high-altitude flight. The latest road closure updates from Boca Chica indicate that the static fire test will commence as early as Monday, followed by the suborbital test flight. Also, a new space operations TFR has been posted for Brownsville, restricting flight operation in the designated area from April 27 to 29.
For the second time in two weeks, SpaceX has rolled out another ground support equipment tank to the launch site. Precisely two weeks ago, SpaceX rolled and installed the first of those massive GSE propellant tanks near the orbital launch site. Built with the same parts, facilities, and equipment as flightworthy Starship prototypes, SpaceX is building these storage tanks to hold propellants for orbital Starship flights. SpaceX is planning to build and install at least seven such tanks that should be able to store enough propellant for two back-to-back -back orbital Starship launches. The existence of self-built propellant storage tanks, virtually identical to flightworthy Starship airframes tells us that SpaceX is effectively tweaking rocket parts and turning them into a propellant storage tank, saving a few million dollars on its Starship project. SpaceX will most likely have enough propellant storage tanks installed for orbital Starship launch attempts in less than a month, as GSE Tank 3 is already more than half full and sections of GSE 4 are in the works. Speaking about the orbital Starship launch, work on the orbital launch tower is progressing in a rapid phase. Four vertical columns were mounted on the launch tower base last week. These vertical columns will be joined together with horizontal and vertical trusses in the upcoming days. The trusses will enable the even distribution of weight and the handling of changing tension and compression without bending or shearing. A recent aerial flyover by RGV Aerial Photography spotted assembly jigs lying next to the air separation unit at the build site. Launch tower truss sections will be bolted together at the build site and will be transported to the launch site for installation. The orbital launch tower will be 140 meters tall when completed. It will be able to stack starships on top of the super heavy booster and will be strong enough to capture the falling booster in mid-air. Work on the orbital launch mount is also in progress, and soon the orbital launch table will be installed onto the launch mount. The nose cone stress test rig got rolled out to the launch site last week. The test rig consists of a nose cone mounted on its barrel section, enclosed in a cage-like structure. Previously a hydraulic ram was installed onto the nose cone before a black cap was added on top of it. This hydraulic ram puts pressure on the nose cone to mimic the condition the nose cone will encounter at max Q during an actual flight. The test rig will put into operation once Starship SN-15 completes its suborbital flight test. On April 23, in a press conference after the Crew-2 launch, Elon Musk spoke a few words about the Starship development program. According to him, Starship design can work even though it's a hard thing to solve. The, the Starship design can work. It's just, it's a hard thing to solve. He added that he is in full confidence that full and rapid reusability can be accomplished with the Starship. He said that the thing that's really important to revolutionize space is a reliable and rapidly reusable rocket. According to him, with rapid reusability, the cost of access to orbit and beyond can be reduced by a factor of 100 or more. The, the thing that's really important to revolutionize space is a rapidly reusable rocket. That's reliable, too. <laughs> Musk noted that he had been somewhat optimistic about SpaceX schedules in the past, but he then added that Starship could be ready to carry people in a couple of years. He said that the 2024 target is achievable, despite the technical challenges. When asked about the NASA HLS contract that SpaceX won two weeks ago, he replied that it's a great honor to be chosen by NASA to return to the moon. Musk said he is thrilled to be part of human spaceflight and is looking forward to make humanity a spacefaring civilization and a multi-planetary species. We don't want to be one of those single-planet species, we want to be a multi-planet species. Now, let's take a look at the current status of various Starship prototypes, with the help of this illustration from Brendan Lewis. The nose cone of Starship serial number 16 received its flaps last week and is now ready for stacking. After mating with the barrel section, the entire nose cone assembly will be lifted and installed atop the tank section of SN-16, which is currently inside the mid-bay. The tank section of serial number 17 with lots of heat shield tiles was spotted at the construction site last week. It appears that SpaceX has cancelled the production of serial numbers 18 and 19, and SN-17 could be the last Starship prototype before SN-20 and booster BN-3 may go orbital. The nose cone and barrel section of Starship serial number 17 and the aft dome section of serial number 20 were spotted at the construction site last week. 
it appears that Super Heavy Booster BN2 will be a test tank to test the structural integrity, and Booster BN2.1 will be the first fully assembled Super Heavy prototype to be rolled out of the build site. The common dome of Booster BN2.1 was spotted at the construction site last week. Watch our previous videos on the playlist to get updates on other Starship prototypes, link in the description. With this, we have covered all the major updates from last week. Please share your thoughts on the latest science news and Starship updates in the comments section. Also, do not forget to subscribe to the channel for more weekly updates. And as always, thanks for watching.